You know, long distance travel on the Can-Am Spider or any motorcycle can be a bit overwhelming. But with a little bit of planning and preparation, your trip can go a lot smoother. And that's going to be the topic of today's video. First, let's get a couple of definitions out of the way. When I'm talking about long duration or long distance moto travel, I'm speaking about travel within North America. Uh, there are a lot of channels that do a lot of long duration travel all over the globe. Uh, this is going to be tailored more towards folks living in North America. Well, there is no actual book definition, in my opinion. Long duration moto travel is travel on a two or three wheel motorcycle uh, that is longer than your typical vacation. If you're used to two week vacations, it would be longer than that. It, it, it really depends on your comfort zone, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone and preparing for those types of travels. I am not an expert in this arena. I'm just a guy who does this. I enjoy doing it and want to share my opinions with you guys. So take what I say with a grain of salt. Try these systems out, these procedures out to see if they work for you. If they do, great. If not, that's okay too. The first major area is destinations and route planning. You get to pick your own destination, go where you want to go, see what you want to see, and you get to pick the route. If you're interested in going from point A to point B as quickly and efficiently as possible, the interstate highway system may be for you. If you're looking for a leisurely route, a more scenic route, then you may want to take the back roads. Pro tip, sometimes the interstate is the scenic route, especially in the western part of the United States, and sometimes not. And the best way to find out is to use the paper maps, typically available at your local bookstore or through AAA. I've not found the source that actually denotes the scenic routes uh, on a web-based map system. Google Earth does not do it. And you can always tell it's a scenic route by the little blue dots along the route. Next is determining how far do you want to travel in a given day? Clearly, if you're traveling on an interstate, you can travel much faster and cover a lot more ground. If you're traveling the back roads, speed limits are typically lower, and there's traffic, traffic lights, small towns with lower speed limit zones. So how far can you actually go in a given day? Well, that depends on you and your style of travel. This is why I recommend that if you're new to moto travel, get out there on your machine and make some test runs. When we first got the Spider, I took it out for a three-day run, a triangular route, went up to West Virginia, down through Southwest Virginia, then back home, and I was able to get an idea how far I could travel in a given day. We found a pace and a speed that was comfortable for us that we use as the foundation for our travel planning. You may be the kind of person that can make 600 miles a day. You may be the kind of person that can only do 100 miles a day. Whatever is comfortable for you, it's your ride, you ride it. Now, our general rule of thumb, we like to be in the saddle by about 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning and done about 3 or 4 in the afternoon. Why are we finishing so early? Well, we're shooting a lot of video. We have to catalog the video, and plus I have an entire set of procedures I like to do every day to make sure I haven't forgot anything important so we can capture all the video and the audio. We also build a schedule we typically will ride three days and take one day as a non-ride day, then ride three more days. That may vary a little bit depending on exactly where we're at. And the reason we do that is we give ourselves a day to not only rest ourselves from riding on the, uh, on the spider, but to do laundry, to do shopping, to do sightseeing crunching video, and that sort of thing. That frequency, that, that three and one, may vary a little bit depending on where we're at and what we're doing. 
We also found out through experience that traveling, even during your non-ride days, can be tiring. We will build into our schedule a rest day, typically at least one rest day per seven-day period. That's a day we have no scheduled things to do. We just sloth around and just relax and rejuvenate. I may crunch some videos and just do a little light sightseeing, but typically it's a non-structured day. You'll find if you do that, it will make the trip a lot better. Now, I found out the hard way when I finished the Asphalt Odyssey of 2019. I dropped Miriam off at the airport in Colorado Springs, and I came straight back home without taking any non-ride days or rest days. When I got home, I was thoroughly exhausted, and I realized that I should have taken some non-ride days and mixed them in to that, uh, that schedule. And I kicked myself in the butt every day for not doing that. Next is your accommodations. How will you spend the night? Are you going to spend the night at a hotel? Are you going to camp? Are you going to stay in Airbnbs? Or mix it up a little bit of all three? It's entirely up to you and whatever works best for you. We like the combination of hotels and Airbnbs. The next question is, how far in advance do you make reservations? We have found that with the exception of the really hot spots, for example, in the 2022 trip, we already have reservations in the Yosemite National Park area because they're really, really hard to get. So we had to make those in advance. Those are some hard fixed dates. The rest of our itinerary is going to be quite flexible. You may find that you want to take a break uh, because of fatigue or weather delays, or you just want to sightsee some more in a given area. So flexibility is the key to an enjoyable trip. If you have yourself a hard fixed itinerary through the entire trip, you're going to find yourself to be stressed and a little tired because you're just trying to make the next block. Give yourself a little flexibility. Now, how far in advance do we make reservations typically? I like to have an idea of how far I'm going to go in a given day, and we will generally make a reservation at our end point either the night before or that morning for our next or our next stop. I don't want to arrive into a town late in the evening and realize there are no hotels in the area, which means we could possibly have to ride uh, late at night, which I preferred not to do, to find an accommodation. And the accommodations may not be someplace where we would, would really want to stay. So we try to make some sort of accommodation reservations in advance. Now, we have found that most of your major chain hotels have uh, flexible cancellation policies. You have a choice of room rates, generally speaking. You have one that you could actually cancel up till 4 o'clock in the afternoon and have no penalty, and you get a different rate, which is typically lower, but you cannot cancel. That means you're fixed at that schedule, and you get to decide which way you want to go with that. Airbnbs, each one's a little bit different on their cancellation policies. You got to read the fine print of each particular place you're looking at staying to find out what their policy is. We found that during the Asphalt Odyssey of 2019, when we had the Wolf Creek Pass incident, we both got hypothermia, we were already suffering from head colds, that we made it off the mountain and checked into a hotel early. We had reservations at Airbnb at a town much further away. We tried to call and cancel, explaining our plight, and they were not the least bit uh, accommodating, and we ended up having to pay for that night's stay, even though we weren't there. The next topic is meal selection. It can easily become the second biggest light item in your travel budget right after uh, accommodations. Now, the, one of the ways to cut this down is prepare your own meals. Uh, since we have the trailer for the spider, we carry a cooler, we carry a bag, which we call our pantry bag, which we keep uh, a selection of food, which we'll get into a little bit later, what we actually carry. But we try to prepare as much food as we can. Now, we don't want to take away from the trip's excitement by not eating out at all, but at least one out of every three or every four meals we'll probably eat out, and then we'll prepare our own. Trying to prepare a meal if you're staying in a conventional hotel room can be tricky. They sort of frown on you preparing meals uh, in a hotel room. But many hotel rooms do have microwave ovens. We also carry a small camp stove for boiling water if the microwave is not available. Uh, and we often use the freeze-dried meals where you simply add water and you have a meal. We always try to carry a few of those freeze-dried meals with us and keep those in stock. So in the event we arrive late and our food options are limited, we know we can have a nice meal in the room simply by boiling water. 
One of the things we've added to our trip planning is we like to stay additional to Airbnbs, which often have kitchens. We try to stay at hotels, which have kitchenettes or kitchens. Many hotel chains uh, offer this for a little bit more money. Uh, and the money is then saved by not having to eat out. you got to figure a average meal at a dinner restaurant is going to set you back 50 bucks. So if you can eat a few meals, especially during your non-ride days and your rest days, stay at a hotel that has a kitchen or a kitchenette where you can actually go to the store, buy some things, and keep them in the refrigerator in the room, and prepare your own meals. You'll save a lot of money. Now, since we don't know what stuff they offer in each room, we try to carry our own basic kitchen supplies with us. Uh, some pans, frying pan, plates, coffee cups, and things of that nature. And that way, we could cook a healthy meal in the hotel rooms or in the Airbnb without having to go out for every single meal and then really run the cost of your trip way up. Of course, if you're camping, that's not a problem. You use your camp stove or build a campfire and you cook your meals over that. Not an issue. If you spend enough time traveling, as we have, you will experience illnesses, injury, mechanical breakdowns, or perhaps even an emergency at home, which requires you to get back home as quick as possible. Sometimes these delays can be an inconvenience. Sometimes they can be an absolute showstopper. So you always have to have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. For example, if we plan a spider trip, which is more than a couple of days from home, we always carry with us whatever we might need in the event we have to park the spider and then fly home on a commercial airliner. That means nowadays you have to carry the appropriate level of identification to even get on the airplane and make sure you had the financial wherewithal to buy a ticket and to park your spider or your motorcycle someplace safe while you're at home dealing with the emergency. We've also decided that if we have a catastrophic event with the spider that we can't drive it or we're injured to the point where we can't drive it, that we can rent a U-Haul and we've worked out a system to get the spider and the trailer in the back of the U-Haul and then ferry it home. Another contingency you need to consider, what if your machine is broken down for a couple days and it will impact your trip? Well, here again, this is why you try not to have a rigid schedule. But if you want to continue the trip while your machine is being repaired, rent a car. Try to be in a position where you can actually rent a car, leave your machine behind so it can get the appropriate repair and love it needs while you still continue your trip and do some sightseeing and enjoying the travels. Because of my background in aviation, we spend a large percentage of the training time training for what-if scenarios, emergencies, how to handle them and what to do. And that carries over to today because they do occur, whether you're driving a sedan or whether you're driving a, a motorcycle. You need to have a plan B because if you travel, things are going to happen and you might as well think about them in advance and have a plan worked out. It's better to be in a position that, oh my, I never thought this would ever happen to an attitude of, you know, I suspected this might happen one day, and I thought through what I was going to do in advance. It gives you a little bit more sense of security and a lot less stress. You know, the topics that we can cover in this video series on long duration moto travel can fill volumes. But these are the ones that I think are the most important and the ones that are sometimes often the most overlooked and cause the most trouble. But if there are other areas that you would like to uh, hear talked about uh, on our channel or gone over, please put them in the comments below. Don't forget, this is a two-part program. The next installment, we're going to cover exactly what we take and how we actually pack it for easy retrieval to make the stress of travel even less. Because I don't know about you, but there's nothing more nightmarish than getting to your hotel room and trying to find the toothbrush or whatever that you've got buried down inside your packing. So packing systems are critical for a stress-free travel. So until next time, guys, thanks for watching. If you haven't pressed the subscribe button, we really appreciate it. Please give us a thumbs up. Uh, the algorithm of YouTube calculates those and gets us more views and which motivates us to produce more high quality videos. So again, guys, thanks for watching. Y'all take care. Bye-bye.